Well, thank you, Tom. It's great to be here. And hi, everybody. It's great to be here this evening, and I'm excited to talk about landscaping. Well, let's get right into it. Our focus is on how to improve uh, our, our current landscapes. Now, most of, uh, most of our homes, there we go. Now, most homeowners live in a house that's already been landscaped. Now, the principles that we talk about will apply to brand new landscapes as well, but we're especially going to focus on things that we as homeowners who have a landscape already installed and growing can do to make those landscapes even better. And now almost all landscapes can be improved. You know, there almost anything can stand a little bit of improvement. You know, some places uh, need a little more improvement than others. But we're going to take a look. And of the ideas that we present, not all of these will need to be implemented to every home. But we can kind of pick and choose the concepts that will make our own home more attractive. Now, here's a painting, and it's, it's much easier to design a perfect landscape on a painted canvas. In real life, it can be a little trickier to get that landscape to look exactly the way that we'd like it to. But there are specific ways that we can use to improve almost any landscape. And that's what we're going to focus on are some specifics that we can look at for improving our landscapes. Now here's the first one, and it's first because it's probably the most important. And the first rule in this is to create a focal point at the home's front entry. And in all of home landscape, this is probably the most important concept, is this focal point. Now the focal point of the home landscape is the point uh, if a person is driving by on the street or walking along on the sidewalk and looking at our home landscapes, the focal point is where the eye would naturally be drawn. And uh, the eye should naturally be drawn to the home's front entry. And in that way, the entire landscape and the home will look very welcoming to people. And it just creates an entire package. So even if a person did uh, nothing else with improvement in your home landscape, creating a focal point at the front entry goes a long ways to improving the entire landscape. Now, how do we create a, a focal point at the entry? Well, as we can see here, uh, we've grouped plant material up towards the front door. We've even used some impatience that are similar color as the front door. So notice the way when you look at that photo, it just kind of glides to the front entry. And other ways that can be used, uh, notice the, the house on the left, the bluish gray home. Uh, of course, the sidewalk naturally focuses your eye up to the front door, but they've also used plantings on either side of that sidewalk, and the whole thing just guides your eye to the focal point of the front door. The other photos uh, use flowers, annual flowers. We could use perennial flowers as well. Uh, notice the lower right-hand photo of the gray house. Uh, the flowers planted in front, notice the way that they just guide your eye. That could be even more effective if they included the same type of flowers a little closer up towards the front door, maybe even some pots of flowers up at that point. And now uh, an easy way to create that front entry focal point is through the use of container flowers. Notice the grouping of three, uh, uh, three on the photo on the right. Notice the grouping of three, how that just uh, leads your eye also up to the front door. Uh, so the use of flowering containers is an easy way through the spring, summer, and fall to create that focal point. Our rule number two is if we are in a house that has older plantings, uh, rejuvenating and trimming those overgrown shrubs works very well to give a renewed look to the landscape. 
So first of all, let's talk about if we've got old overgrown deciduous leafy shrubs, let's talk about rejuvenating those for a minute. Now many deciduous leafy shrubs can be rejuvenated nicely and given a whole new look by cutting back to about six inches above ground level. And the time to do that is spring, April works beautifully, before the shrub leafs out. And by cutting them back, we get rid of all the old wood and they'll sprout nicely from the base. Uh, this works very well with potentilla, spirea, lilac, dogwood, ninebark, mock orange, and more. We can't do this with evergreens, it doesn't work. But by cutting these back, and now is not the time to be timid. If we cut back an old overgrown woody shrub, if we only cut it back halfway, we still have an old overgrown a shrub, it's just not quite as tall. So take the leap and go all the way back. It, it does work very, very well. And April is a good time to do that. And maybe our shrubs don't need a total rejuvenation. Maybe they just need a little trimming to make them look neater or to maintain the size a bit. So when trimming shrubs, using a hand shears or loppers to selectively cut branches works well. So we can selectively kind of randomly cut the branches. That will maintain a nice natural shape. Now shearing shrubs uh, with a head shears or a motorized trimmer uh, gives kind of an unnatural shape. So in most cases that's not as uh, natural, a uh, pleasing looking as the selective cutting that we talked to about before. Unless your home is very, very formal and you have a sheared type landscape. But otherwise, shearing of shrubs really does not look that natural around most of our homes. Unless, of course, you live in Disneyland. Okay, now the idea three. Many foundation plantings, when they were installed, were not extended far enough out from the foundation at any time. You know, the shrubs look so small when they're small, but when they grow, then they extend outward. And, you know, I've never heard anybody say, you know, 25, 30 years down the road after planting, I've never heard anyone say, you know, we came way too far out from the house with our planting bed. Yeah, usually it's the opposite. Um, so what do we do if we didn't come out far enough? You know, in 10, 12 feet would be a nice distance out. Uh, but what if we didn't do that? Well, we could trim up our shrubbery or rejuvenate them, but we can also bring out, extend out that existing planting bed. You know, leave the shrubs, the older shrubs, rejuvenate, trim but bring the edging out farther into the lawn to give kind of a look of a new edge. Now we could do that by digging out the sod, or if the sod is weak, we could rototill, or we could even leave the sod in place, but smother it with newspaper or layers of cardboard, and or we could use a grass killing herbicide to kill off, and then dig down and install a new edge a ways out from the shrubbery. And what that will do by extending that edge out, giving it kind of a nice crisp look, that will give the appearance uh, that it is that the planting bed is out at the appropriate distance from the foundation. Then we can add new mulch and give a good crisp look. So even a foundation planting that was installed too close to the house foundation, we could recover it at this time by coming out farther and installing fresh new edging. Now idea four, create curves in the landscape. Now in nature, curves, curving lines are just restful, relaxing, a good natural feel. So if our home landscape was installed with straight, linear, or rectangular lines, it's not too late to introduce curves into it. And you know, we can do that in a fairly sim few simple ways. An, uh, an extension cord or a garden hose can be used to kind of uh, test out the curves that you'd like. You can kind of uh, manipulate those in different ways to get a, a curving, gentle flowing. Then once you have those where you'd like them, you can paint on the grass and then use a shovel to 
cut down through the turf and install a new edging. Now take a look at the photo on the left that is a very straight line. Now imagine how that would look if we introduced a broad sweeping curve. You know, we'd probably have to add some more hosta to follow the curve, but wouldn't that look pleasing with, with those nice sweeping curves? Now we can overdo it. The photo on the right is a little bit too squiggly. Now I mentioned we're talking about broad sweeping curves. Uh, the, the squiggly lines, if you look at that long enough, you kind of get a little seasick. So again, not, not too squiggly. We want a nice broad sweeping curve in those. Okay, our idea number five, keep the edges neat and crisp. Now this is fairly easy to do on our landscapes. If we've got edging installed, we can with a weed trimmer uh, just trim up, neaten, uh, remove the, uh, remove any grass that's kind of growing over the edging. Uh, we could even dig out the grass that's maybe creeped over onto the edging. But notice how sharp and clean that beautiful edge looks. And that really makes almost any landscape pop. Our idea six. Avoid developing landscape beds smack dab in front of the house that could divert attention away from the house or even block the view of the house. So um, now if you already have a planting bed right square in front of the house, I mean, uh, don't remove it. Don't tell your spouse, well, Kinsler said that all has to go. No, we work with what we have. But if you don't already have a planting bed right square in front of the house, Maybe instead of that, keep the plantings off to the sides. Notice how pleasing this is. They have a tree off to the sides, planting kind of off. We can visualize the house. So keep, keep our plantings kind of off to the side perimeters rather than right in front of the house. Now in that way, the home will always be the visible feature. And of course, in our home landscapes, that is a key element. Our home should be the feature and we should always be able to kind of see the home. The landscape is meant to soften. So instead of just plantings along the foundation, it works very well to save some of those landscape dollars and plant material off to the sides, to the perimeters as well. And then it will look like the house was placed into a nice natural setting. Our idea number seven, when you're going to locate trees, avoid planting trees where they'll block the view of the house. You know, landscaping in many ways is what is a, a treat that you give to the community. We all enjoy driving by, walking by and looking at people's front landscape. And so we want to see your home in its natural setting. Now in the photo on the left of the gray house, beautiful tree, we're certainly not going to cut it down. But when that tree was planted, if it would have been planted farther towards the garage, it would help kind of conceal the garage and we would be able to see the house better. That way we'd enjoy both the tree and the home. So uh, always uh, picture when we plant a young tree, picture what it will look like when it grows. Idea eight is an important one also. Now when you plant a tree and shrub, always investigate the eventual width and height. So that for, with a shrub, for example, uh, look at the tag or investigate what is the eventual width of that shrub so that when you're planting a little shrub, you give it the footprint that is needed to accommodate that width. Idea nine, now this is a fun one. Utilize the potential of the backyard corners, especially if it's fenced in like this, or even if it isn't fenced, we can give some privacy to it. So let's look at some ideas, what we could do with those unused back corners. Wouldn't this be fun to go sit in that back corner like that? Uh, kind of a little private oasis. Some other ideas, we could use those back corners of the backyard to develop a new perennial garden or develop a um, spot like that to go and sit. That would be fun too. Idea 10 is to make use of our small spaces. Maybe it's the spot between your house and the neighbor's house. 
spots like that can be utilized very nicely. Uh, there are many columnar or pyramidal straight up type shrubs, even some small trees that go upward instead of out. Perennial flowers work well for areas like that. And so good areas to utilize if space is limited. Ideas 11 and 12, add a bench. A bench put in a landscaping, whether it's even in the front yard, but off to the side or in the backyard, a bench. Uh, even if we in our gardening times don't have time to always sit there, it's pleasing to know that that bench is there and it just makes a, uh, it makes a landscape look very restful. Also lighting can help extend our use of the landscape into the evening, especially the backyard. And so many of these solar powered lights are very useful for that. Now idea 13, combine perennial flowers into the landscape. Instead of just shrubbery, if we combine hardy, winter hardy perennials, we can use perennial types. We can plant some that are early summer blooming and then plant a few that are summer flowering and include fall blooming ones. So then we will have a landscape that is continually changing with bright new flowers all season long. And that, that makes the landscape fun. Idea 14, control the weeds. Uh, maybe not such a fun part of the landscape, but oh so necessary. Now a couple of weed control ideas. Now we can see a uh, preen being sprinkled over landscape bed. Now preen is a granular weed preventer. It has to be applied onto clean, weed free. Uh, it won't prevent weeds coming from the root, such as quackgrass, thistle, such as that, but it can help reduce labor. Now it's important to know that Landscape fabric does allow weeds to grow. They can sprout from above and root, uh, root down and come from below. So we need to monitor. It's fun to walk around the landscape in the evening, at least a couple of times a week. And as weeds start, you know, pluck them out right away. On the left-hand side, there is a grass killer that can selectively uh, kill grass out of other perennials. So that's, uh, that's a very effective tool as well. Now shredded mulch is a great use in our landscape. Uh, the wood product mulches are much more plant friendly than rock. Rock tends to get hot and it compresses the soil. So wood product mulch is much more plant friendly than the rock. Idea 15. Uh, the lawn is meant to be merely a canvas on which the rest of the landscape is featured. So uh, many of us are reducing the size of our lawns, but even if we have a smaller lawn, we can keep it healthy with a couple of easy to do things. Uh, first of all, let the clippings filter back in. There's no need to bag them up. The clippings uh, add nutrients, they add organic matter. So no need to haul to the waste, uh, the waste collection site. Mow your lawn high uh, at a three inch level. It'll outcompete weeds and keep the roots cooler as well. And unless your lawn is a total carpet of weeds, there's no need to spray the entire lawn. Just a little bit of spot spray on the weeds that pop up or just dig them out. Fertilizing, if you choose one time of year, the most effective for lawn fertilizing is September Labor Day. Secondary time, Memorial Day. Watering. Water deeply and less often. Uh, don't water frequent shallow sprinklings. That causes weak shallow roots. Instead, water one inch per week in one application or in light sand, else divide the inch into two waterings. Now, idea 16, know our hardiness zone. Now, if we plant material and check the tag or do some investigating, Plant material that's winter hardy in zones three is well adapted for our area. Now, plant material that's specified for zone four, we, we should investigate a little bit. Because zone four is a large zone, as you can see, from north to south, and some of the plant material, trees, shrubs, perennials, listed as zone four would be happier in the southern borders of zone four. So do a little investigating uh, on zone four. Now, our home is definitely our castle, and if we can take some of these ideas and improve our landscape just a little bit, then we'll really enjoy it all the more. And of course, the most important rule 
in landscaping, above all else, is to enjoy. And thank you very much. Let's see if there are any questions. Thanks, Don. Wow, that was totally inspiring. Got to say. Does anybody have any questions for Don? And if you read them off, Tom, I might be able to see, but if you'll read them anyway, so that would be great. So far, Don, I just got I just got people saying wow. Oh, well, that's wonderful. <laughs> well, uh, uh, if, if we've got a minute, how about if I give another comment? Common question on cleaning perennial flower beds, or if we have perennials in the landscape. Um, perennials overwinter better if the tops are left on all fall and then removed in the spring uh, before the new growth starts. But now it's interesting. We've learned, uh, we keep learning, which is fun. Uh, now we've learned that n uh, native natural bees and pollinators are often nesting in those hollow stems of perennials. And so if we remove those stems, there may still be pollinators in there. So instead of burning them, uh, just stack them to the back of the perennial bed and leave them there until at least midsummer. Okay, Don, the questions are starting to roll in now. How about, do you have any comments about water features? Water features, wonderful. Uh, they give such a relaxing, restful feel. And so especially in the backyard, backyard corners, uh, water features e excellent. How about uh, this person has a blue spruce tree that's 20 years old and was planted too close to the house? Yeah, what blue spruce planted uh, too close to the house. Now, um, that brings up the case of pruning evergreens. Now, when we prune evergreens, they don't respond the same way that leafy deciduous shrubs do. We can't cut evergreens back the same way. So usually pruning, even to uh, limit the size, needs to be in, uh, our, our pruning cuts need to be kept in the outer perimeter where there's still good healthy growth. Uh, so it's difficult to cut way back onto a, a spruce or other evergreen because they just won't come back. So a too tall spruce is difficult. Uh, there's not a whole lot that can be done. Uh, if it still looks good, then sometimes it looks good. But yeah, there's not a good way to remedy a spruce that was planted too close. And that's very common, you know, because they look so cute when they're small. Yep. How about, uh, Don, do you have a favorite material for edging? Because your photos edges. Favorite material for edging. Now, that's fun. I, myself, just personal preference, I kind of like bricks. You can get old recycled bricks uh, fairly easy. That gives a nice natural edging. Uh, I've still used a fair amount of the black vinyl edging. That looks good. It becomes kind of um, invisible almost. Uh, steel edging is good. The Canadians use a lot of uh, no edging. They just cut that nice crisp edge, but you do have to maintain it. So they almost don't use any edging. They let a kind of a cut be the edge. Um, so uh, I guess the, the edging is not meant to be too visible. So I like natural brick because then it just kind of blends. So the less visible the edging, probably the better. Okay. How about uh, preventing grass in rose beds? Is I saw in your photo you had grass be gone. Yes, Is that too harsh for roses? No, that would work beautifully. Uh, there are um, herbicides, weed killers, that are specific to killing grass. Uh, one is the uh, the ortho product that I pictured uh, called Grass Be Gone. Another company um, is, let's see, I believe it's called Grass Beater. And so anyway, they are specific to killing grasses, um, grass type of plants. So they will not harm broad leaves like roses. Um, so a person needs to read and follow the label directions, but on the label directions, if it's on the label, you can apply the grass killer right over the top of something like a rose or a peony, but try to target the grass. And they will; those products will selectively kill the grass. They're usually slow acting. You may have to apply a couple of times, but they are quite effective. But always read and follow label directions. 
this person likes mulching and wood mulch, but the problem is it keeps blowing away. Is that any? Yeah, that's a good, feature? good question. Now, the the um, wood chips, you know, the kind of chunks of wood or bark chunks, they tend to blow and float away much, uh, much more readily than the shredded bark. And the shredded bark, there's even some some called double shredded, uh, they tend to nest together and pack together better. Um, and so some of those tend to be maybe a little more expensive uh, because, uh, you know, they're probably worth it. They nest together a little better. So look for a kind of more finely ground or more fibers that would kind of pack together better, kind of the double shredded uh, wood product bark mulch. Okay. Some of the bargain brands I notice tend to float and blow better or uh, worse. Right. Okay. This is a little bit off target, but we're going to hit you with it. And it has to do with, uh, have you ever heard of shedding needle disease in Douglas fir? Shedding needle disease for Douglas fir. You know, Douglas fir are not that common. I know there are some okay. around. I don't know a whole lot about the needle shedding on Douglas fir. Um, so that, of course, wouldn't be yeah. susceptible to some of these spruce type disease since Douglas fir is a different species. So, no, I'm drawing a blank on that one. I could right. certainly uh, look up some information on that. Okay, you can contact Don directly, and he's in yeah, the cast. Yeah, at the end of this, yeah, um, donald.kinsler at ndsu.edu. I'm not sure if we're listing my contact at the end or not. You know, also that's not fall needle drop, is it? I don't. I've never heard of shedding needle disease. Um, no, that's a that's a new one for me. But uh, yeah. I'm not overly let's, familiar with Douglas fir diseases. But right, let's move ahead here. How about? Uh, do you have any comments about using shredded rubber mulching? Ah, uh, no, that's a wonderful question. Shredded rubber mulch, and sometimes it's sold packaged, and uh, it's oftentimes dyed as well. Now, I've seen research, research questioning the use of that around plant materials because the rubber mulch made from ground up tires could possibly leach um, oily type materials down into the soil. So I have seen some research cautions on that. Uh, so I wonder if shredded rubber mulch might be better on a playground, um, but they are looking at it to see if there are, are any leaching type materials. So the jury's probably still out on that, but I have my hesitation for rubber mulch around plants. Okay, how about, uh, let's talk about lilies. Are there some lilies that you dig up in the fall and you have to store indoors, or can all lilies remain in the ground through the winter? Well, there is a there is variance in the winter hardiness of lilies. The Asiatic lilies are normally fully hardy, um, and of course, when you look up lilies, they're categorized. Uh, Asiatic lilies are generally hardy for our area, remain in the ground all winter. The oriental lilies, one of the most popular is the stargazer lily, the pink and white stargazer. They're marginally hardy. Uh, they can be left out, but mulch. Um, and the Easter type lily is a lily species that is not generally hardy, but sometimes we can get it to grow if you put a two feet of mulch over it in the winter time. Um, so the best to plant are the Asiatic lilies. There's a group called Mardigan lilies and the Oriental lilies with mulch. And otherwise, um, rather than digging up and storing indoors and planting, probably better to choose those that are more reliable and hardy. Because like the Asiatics, there's all kinds of good, uh, good um, varieties in wide ranging colors. Okay, I think that's all the questions we got, Don, tonight. I just got to say, man, that, that was totally inspiring. I am. Wait, uh, aren't we, aren't we going to all enjoy getting out there again? You know, when you see a few little <laughs> sprigs of green out there, aren't we going to enjoy this again? It was known in Bismarck a little bit today. So a little bit yes, of that. we had, I, uh, in Fargo here, we woke up with a light covering of frosty <laughs> snow as well. So, and yeah, we're going to. We're gonna, we're going to be ready, and we're going to be uh, what's the word? Not entitled, but we we deserve a good spring. 
Don, let me just ask this. Tell me a few of your favorite perennials. Favorite perennials? Yeah. The daylilies. The daylilies. Uh, and not the little Stella Dioro that's in front of every dentist office, but the daylilies. They're such wonderful ones. Buttered popcorn is one of my favorites. Tall flocks, uh, some of the newer ones that are disease resistant. Tall flocks are wonderful. Um, uh, let's see. Gosh, it's like trying to pick uh, your favorite children. Um, Monarda, wonderful. The cone flowers. Uh, well, so those are just a few. Peonies. Gosh, I love peonies. And some of the new hybrids, uh, the cost is coming down on some of the new hybrid peonies. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Don, again.